Come on in. So we'll sort of let you decide on yourselves. I know you want it to be on the back, right? So help yourself, and then anybody else can come on up to the front. Is everybody comfortable? Do you want to edge slightly apart, or is that you're, you're good? Yeah, OK. So thanks, all of you, for being here today. Uh, this is really a little bit unprecedented for CHCH to have this opportunity to speak with uh, first responders here to talk about that, uh, that unfortunately deadly uh, and tragic uh, via rail derailment last Sunday. Uh, we appreciate you taking your time for being here. Um, Jim, I can tell you're the most experienced guy here. Um, Tell me a little bit about what was going through your mind. Uh, you've, you've had a long career in the Burlington Fire Department. What was going through your mind as you arrived at the scene? Uh, well, we actually did um, a training exercise 30 years ago. I had only been on the job for a short time then. And uh, we did a train derailment involving a school bus and uh, fire uh, ambulance and, uh, and uh, police were all involved. And uh, it was actually, it was a great scenario. And so right away I thought, oh, I kind of done this it's been a while but so uh, yeah we were the second truck on scene and I was the uh, first into the train and uh, you know what your training just kicks in it comes back right away yeah. yeah yeah so what did you see when you jumped in that train well first were when I walked in there were two cars the first train uh, first train car is the engine so then the first passenger car and the second passenger car were kind of on an angle. And so when I walked in, you could look into both cars. <clears throat> and what I did was talk to somebody at the end of each car to find out what they had inside. And the first car was the worst. So I crawled into that car. And when you got inside the car, what were you seeing there? Uh, there was a gentleman in a wheelchair. The wheelchair's tucked, like tied in at the corner. And he's over on this side. And I basically just crawled through and talked to everybody. Uh, talked to him, he was fine. Um, there were a couple of women that were injured and they only spoke French, but there was somebody else that interpreted for them. Uh, went further, there was a family of three. The 10-year-old girl had a broken arm. The, uh, her father was on his back and he had gone through the windshield or the window of the train. And there was a bunch of rebar behind him and um, at that point, he was the worst injured, as far as I was concerned. So, Kim, how does it work when you're, when you're on those trains and doing that kind of thing? How do you then so quickly assess who you're going to deal with first, who you're going to try to help first? I think you just take one patient at a time. And uh, I know when they were coming out of the trains, the EMS were using their triage system. Mm -hmm. Before you even get to that point, though, it's just you know a, a quick assessment of you know their level of consciousness. Are they able to speak with you? Can they answer some simple questions? And can they tell you what their injuries are? Quite often, when there's other people injured, they'll you know they could point out someone else, which would let you know that someone else is more injured than they are. Right. Right. Okay. So you sort of have to use their use their words in a sense, or at least their actions or capabilities. So you're triaging back there, Colin, and, and you're seeing these people come off the train. What, what's going through your mind? I mean, have you ever attended a scene like this? Uh, no, this is the first uh, major incident for me in my career. And um, I mean, you just, you have to start filtering through the people. Uh, generally, the ones that can come right to you um, are probably not the most injured. So those are the ones that we ask if they can just maybe stand aside for a second. Somebody will be with them eventually. We assign them um, a color coding so that any paramedic that uh, does eventually attend to them has an idea that they've been seen. We've asked them a few quick questions, whether they can breathe, what their injuries are, and uh, that uh, we've moved on to a higher priority patient. So the biggest challenge is filtering through and finding the, the That really must be difficult ones. though, because these people have just under, undergone some sort of traumatic, stressful event. I mean, they must, they must all, in a sense, be either freaking out or angry that's what's happened, and maybe that they're not getting the right kind of attention. I mean, how do you, how do you manage that? Well, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we have to continually keep coming back to them and reassessing them and making sure nothing has changed. Um, when we have the resources, we finally will assign a medic to specifically go and physically assess all of those patients to make sure we haven't missed an injury. Mm -hmm. And we always ask them that if anybody becomes worse around them, if they can just let somebody know and we will get to them.
So, so much of this comes down to communications, clearly. So, from a, from a policing perspective, then, at the scene here, you've got the paramedics and the firefighters sort of going into the trains and assessing the patients. What's your role at the scene, then? Our role is actually, it's kind of a larger uh, view of the scene in its entirety. We also have uh, background considerations as to uh, what was the cause. I know for me as, a, as the responding supervisor, I, first thing I was concerned about was uh, what type of train. Was there cargo, dangerous cargo, anything that could affect the community uh, in a greater area. So once we recognized that we were dealing with a passenger train, then we could start uh, bringing in some of our resources and assisting our uh, EMS partners in uh, facilitating their work. One of the things in our back of, uh, certainly in my mind, was, uh, and, and not to say that it, uh, who's to say it couldn't happen here, just as easily as anywhere else, but was there a criminal act that preceded the, the train? Was it caused uh, by uh, some outside uh, source or organization? These are, these are questions that we, when responding, don't have answers to. So always in the back of our mind, we're thinking evidence preservation, scene preservation, protection of, uh, protection of life. But as we're, as we're responding initially, it's all about safety. And uh, even the training kicks in as far as, you know, many years ago when I went to OPC, they taught uh, urgent emergency first. So always try to find out what's the, the greatest uh, crisis, deal with that, and then we start to, to work down from there. So moving back to that, then when, when you're when you're arriving at the train, then as well, like you just alluded to here, you've got this scenario where you don't know what the scenarios could be, whether it could be some sort of criminal act, some sort of per perhaps terrorist group. Uh, we do know at least the initial report seems to indicate speed, but but you're getting on board this derailed train. Um, how do you know that it's secure? How how do you feel comfortable going in and putting yourself at risk like that? Well, for, well, first of all, you uh, you have to check scene safety to make sure that it is safe around no fluids, glass, uh, any uh, electrical hazards as well too. Uh, but uh, uh, mostly, you just have to uh, sort of weigh the options and, and go for it. So, if I can pick up once again on the paramedic side of things here, so you're seeing all of these these people coming out in various states of injury. Uh, and, you know, some are walking, some are talking, but some are bleeding and some, we could see them in the, in the video, coming out on the stretchers. What are you looking for as the people are coming out? Well, our, our primary goal is to triage those patients that are in the, uh, in the train itself, to determine uh, our own safety, their safety, and to extricate them to a place where they can physically be cared for properly. Um, we don't have an awful lot of equipment with us as triage officers. Mm -hmm. Our primary goal is to assess them and pass them off to the next crew that's able to, to treat them. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that, that you saw that you were dealing with, with out there that Sunday? Uh, well, we had some people that uh, obviously had been thrown about the car. They had some uh, back issues, some pain as far as that goes. There was uh, some minor lacerations and things of that nature. But for a lot of them, uh, they were leaving the coach relatively unscathed. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's obviously a good sign, but we, st we I mean, dozens of people were injured here. I mean, I, I'm not sure how long you've been a member of the firefighter, fire department, Kim, but I mean, in your career, have you ever gone to a call like that? No, not at all. Um, we have been trained in how to use our equipment. We've been trained how to work together. We've been trained how to assess a patient. Uh, so putting all those pieces together, we can apply all of those things. But specifically for a train derailment or something to that degree, no. Yeah. So what goes through your head as you arrive at that scene there? Because it looked fairly chaotic right away. When we, uh, when we drove down Enfield, uh, there was a, a crowd of people waving us towards where the back of the second, first passenger train was meeting the back. I was with Jim. Mm -hmm. um, so where that, those two trains were meeting, back of the first train and the front of the second train, uh, there was just a lot of people coming out. So it was just, we need to get to there. Like we could see kind of uh, the more of massive people. So that's where we need to get to. So we drove our truck as far as we could, uh, parked it out of the way, and then went straight over to the train. And that's where uh, Jim and, and the rest of the crew got into the train while I stayed outside to, to do assessment of, of the area. Now, there were literally dozens of first responders on the scene there that day. Everybody knows their role, right? I mean, you know going to the scene what you're going to be doing, but how does it play out when you actually get there and you realize that so many people need help? Like how does, do you just look at each other or do you just, just go about your work? How, how does that all come together, Jim? I gotta say everybody knows up, like right up front. Um, I mean, I'm happy when the paramedics show up because they're the higher entity. They, they are, you know, if, if you're hurt, you want a paramedic there. I mean, I'll do what I can to 
to stop the bleeding and, and do all the you know the proper first aid but you want a paramedic there to to make sure that if you're you know really injured they're going to get you on the right track how do you overcome your adrenaline to sort of focus well i mean we deal with we deal with tragedies every day this just was a larger scale so um, it's just kind of go into normal mode and one patient at a time um, identify the sickest ones first uh, we stick to the basics in a mass casualty incident um, controlling spinal injuries uh, major bleeds any airway issues other than that we um, we try not to focus beyond that going any further until we can get those into the hands of a, a crew that's going to transport. They can provide further care. Initially, it's just about doing the most, the most good for the most amount of people. It must be, and I think I, I could probably ask each of you this, but it must be quite difficult, right, to sort of get your mind around exactly what Colin was saying there. You're trying to help the, you know, the most critically injured people first, but all of a sudden there's media choppers in the air, there's, there's sort of media on the ground. You start to become aware that this is, again, a mass casualty s scenario. So w w how do you stay focused on that without letting there be any distractions? Like, w what does that take? Mainly uh, just being focused on your task at hand, too, and it, that's, that's what was evident during that call, too, that everybody was split up to their individual tasks and, and with, during, uh, with fire. They, you work with a crew of four people yeah. and normally, and uh, we, I, we were just basically working with that one indiv individual task with our crew. I know you guys deal with tragedy every single day, but do, do you become aware of the sort of the heightened level of scrutiny or public uh, nature that this is going to be having when you're doing your job on a day like that? I think it enters your mind, but uh, you, have, you have the opportunity to just focus on your job. You, you know the job, you've been trained to do these kind of situations. Uh, in my case, I've had previous experience. I was at the uh, Mississauga train derailment and subsequently the, uh, the fire down here at St. Joe's Hospital. So we learned from each of those uh, experiences we're able to put that into work, you know, in future events. So, yeah, the other day it was just a question of you look, you see, and then you act. And that, that's how, how it has to be, really, right? Is there a, a lesson that, that you'll take from the fire department side of things? Like, will, will you, what could you learn from, from what happened that day? We actually lucked out because when we went into the train, the people in, in the train, nobody was panicking. The people that were, were not injured were helping the ones that were. So it was like, I know three people lost their lives. Mm -hmm. But as far as the people in the, in the train car that we were in, everybody was, was great. Like, um, you couldn't have asked for more help from the people that, that were in there that weren't injured that were helping the ones that were. And I mean, let's be honest here, the people that, that died, there was no chance of helping them. I mean, they were in the front car of the right, train correct. that derailed. I mean, so that you know going, that there's not much you can do there. So that, that really is lucky, isn't it, to have that sort of cooperation? Because I assume, well, we know uh, stories where you run into situations where it's chaotic and people are probably arguing with you about help him first, not her or not, you know, it must, uh, so that, that, that is good. Yeah, the passengers, the passengers were great. Yeah. How about from a policing side of things? What, what kind of lessons do you take away uh, from this? And what, what could, I'm not suggesting you did anything wrong in this case, but what do you think you could learn or could do better now that, now that you know, you've had an event like this? Well, I think in any major incident, uh, debriefing it, there's always finer points that we can improve on. But uh, I, I can honestly say as a, as a first responder there, I was very proud of our people. They uh, made my job so much easier. Everyone knew their role. Everyone worked together with everyone. There was no conflict. They only had a job to do and they went out and did it. And I can say that uh, as far as uh, from the Halton Police perspective, we're very pleased with the, the response of our, of our folks that, at that scene. Very chaotic scene, not something I expect to see again, although it is possible, but uh, I, think they, I think they did a great job. I was very, very pleased with, the, with our folks. And how about from a paramedic side of things too, Colin? Because obviously I think it's clear everyone's taking a lesson away from, from what happened. Well, I think we just learned from the experiences themselves, right? I mean, you know, this is something that's basically a hopefully once in a, a career call. Um, but for future events, should they happen, you know, you can draw back on that stuff and really go forward with it. Um, I think we did a, an excellent job, the, all, all three um, departments. Uh, but, you know, again, like I said, finer points, 
we can always learn from them. Um, but uh, as my understanding, we had all patients off to hospitals within 90 minutes, and that's exceptional for that size of an incident. So I think uh, from an EMS standpoint, we, we felt we did a really well, really good job as well. And that, that fact alone, that everyone was off and, and to a hospital within 90 minutes, that seems to speak to the level of cooperation just amongst everybody, right? I mean, you couldn't have done that just as paramedics or just as fire or just as police, right? It was a, you all had to be collectively involved in that, right? Especially, uh, I'm not sure if it was Bob or Colin mentioned how many people we put on backboards to get out. Mm -hmm. And it was, I mean, we all had to help lift that. And I mean, it was awkward in the, ca in the uh, car because it was on a funny angle. So everybody had to chip in and, and pass that backboard through the train. And, and that was over and over as we got guys on backboards and, and ladies. And so, yeah, so it worked well. Were you switching people in and out much? Because 90 minutes is a long time to be in an awkwardly positioned train car. I mean, no. no. You were in there for 90 minutes, right. perhaps longer even. Right. When you're seeing all of this happening, and, and you're, like, where was your checkpoint specifically where you were, you were standing? Uh, the second car behind the engine was on an extraordinary angle. From where I was standing, it was kind of, it was tilted up. So you could look through the opening where it had broken from the third car and see into into the passenger area. Um, so I was down with, there was a fire, paramedic, and three police officers assisting with getting the backboards and the people. So all the assessment was going on inside and there was an off. I remember looking up and seeing an officer standing on the arms of the chairs, of the seats kind of crawling down and assisting inside. And just for a minute thought, isn't that extraordinary? I'm going to ask each of you this, this question. Do you have one memory that sticks out uh, from that day, like a moment or, a, or, or an event uh, that was a sub part of that day? There's quite a few, actually, yeah. So it's, uh, it's quite an experience. It's hard to just say one memory. Like, it's a uh, really good experience for me. It's tragic for the people that, that, that lost their lives, but... Uh, um, is it hard to go back and think about now? Um, no, because I think it's a positive thing because we did help a lot of people. Right. So that's what I'm taking from it. How about you, Jim? Nothing really stands out other than the fact that the passengers were like chipped in and, and helped and, and how smooth it ran. And Kim? The one picture I have is when um, the patients were coming out of the trail car. I think you were saying there was just a, a row of um, you know, there was firefighters, paramedics, police officers. There was just a row of people helping them get it because the, the footing wasn't even. So just a row of people helping, you know, people get to where they needed to be with the ambulance. And that row, everybody was helping. Nobody, you know, even if we had to pass a jacket. To some people, as they were getting off the, the train, they were really concerned about their jacket or they are concerned about their knapsack. So really trying to make sure those things followed that person to mm -hmm. where the, the ground was flat. Um, so just, you know, how everyone was treated as a person coming out and making sure they had their valuables and seeing how everybody worked together to get them to that safe spot. Right. Colin, how about you? Um, I would say probably those initial moments when you first got there, when we were parking our ambulance and we had a large crowd of people just walking towards us because, you know, it's, they see an ambulance, they see help us here and just kind of take a breath and go into doing your job. and. You know, and that's it, you know, just, you know, you're not going to see that kind of thing happen. Hopefully. Too much, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So. How about you? Well, I'll be honest and say that initially we had one call above a train der der derailment, so you're not, you're not a hundred percent sure that that's actually what has occurred yeah. until while responding on a route you hear, now we're starting to receive more calls and then it starts to become real as a, as a responder. So in, uh, in your head is going through countless checklists of different scenarios that could occur. But I remember specifically uh, coming down from the 407, I came from the north end of Burlington. And as I crossed over the 407, I was able to see down the tracks and I saw, and I still see it as a, a snapshot in my mind of the, of the train and its, uh, in its uh, wrecked position. And uh, thinking, wow, there's, uh, there's gonna be a lot of work to do here. How about you, Bob? I think uh, I have to go back to, uh, somebody mentioned the, the gentleman in the wheelchair. He was uninjured, but he presented a little bit of a difficulty in that he was unable to extricate himself. Um, his wheelchair was is still strapped in its position on the on the train, which was now in the uh, hanging from the uh, almost the ceiling. Uh, we had to had that disassembled, reassembled outside the train, 
and we had to um, manage to get him out. We used uh, one of the fire department baskets to get him to crawl into it and then pass him out. Now that was a situation where there was no injury, but it was stage one in accessing and getting the other people off the train safely. And it was, a, it was just a success story because he was reunited with his wheelchair and with all his belongings and he got off there with no, no injuries. Yeah, that, that's definitely a high point there. You get the last shot at this one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just the overall bravery of, of the people inside who were not knowing how injured they were and, and having to, you know, come out into the arms of people who were you know, saying, trust me here, I'll hold on to you while we crawl over this or do this. And they were hurt. Um, just overall cohesion with the disciplines. There wasn't a lot of talking between us, but boy, did things get done quickly when we worked together. I found that, uh, I'm a 15 year veteran and I, I really felt very proud that that's how it pans out when we all react that way. First time for me in my career for sure, and to see my platoon and the other disciplines work that way without much said is pretty profound. Yeah, I get the sense that a lot of you uh, have that pride, but also that feeling that the, that the teamwork and, uh, among interdepartmental teamwork as well, of course, with your own crews really paid off and, and the communication, the coordination, the training really did, did work out this time, didn't it? If, if there's any sort of final thoughts from anybody, I, I'd love to hear anything. Or, go ahead. I'd like, I'd like to just mention the community support that was at the scene. Like, there was countless uh, citizens coming up offering their assistance. We had a doctor come up and offer. I know the, uh, at the end of Plains Road, there was a McDonald's restaurant. They brought food for all the people that came off the train. Uh, a couple of trips, just the community support that rallied, even as the, uh, as the event was unfolding, was, it was tremendous. Yeah, more than just uh, police, fire, and ambulance, of course. Yeah, that's great. I want to thank you all really for being here today. Uh, it certainly was uh, uh, something to pull together. I know you all have very busy schedules and uh, have very busy jobs. But we really appreciate you coming in here and speaking to us today. And uh, thanks for the work you did on Sunday and, of course, every, every other day. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nick. Thank you.